Romancing Mr. Bridgerton, Part 2, Chapter 4 It is difficult to imagine that there is any news from the Bridgerton Ball other than Lady Danbury's determination to discern the identity of this author, but the following items should be duly noted. Mr. Geoffrey Albansdale was seen dancing with Miss Felicity Featherington. Miss Felicity Featherington was also seen dancing with Mr. Lucas. Hotchkiss Dot Mur. Lucas Hotchkiss was also seen dancing with Miss Hyacinth Bridgerton. Miss Hyacinth Bridgerton was also seen dancing with Viscount Berwick. Viscount Berwick was also seen dancing with Miss Jane Hotchkiss. Miss Jane Hotchkiss was also seen dancing with Mr. Colin Bridgerton. Mr. Colin Bridgerton was also seen dancing with Miss Penelope Featherington. And to round out this incestuous little ring around the rosy. Miss Penelope Featherington was seen speaking with Mr. Geoffrey Albansdale. It would have been too perfect if she actually danced with him. Don't you agree, dear reader, Lady Whistledown's Society? Papers, 12 April, 1, 8-4 When Penelope and Colin entered the drawing room, Eloise and Hyacinth were already sipping tea, along with both of the ladies Bridgerton, Violet, the Dowager, was seated in front of a tea service, and Kate, her daughter E-in-law and the wife of Anthony, the current Viscount, was attempting, without much success, to control her two-year-old daughter Charlotte. Look who I bumped into in Berkeley Square, Colin said. Penelope, Lady Bridgerton said with a warm smile, Do sit down. The tea's still nice and hot and Cook made her famous butter biscuits. Colin made a beeline for the food, barely pausing to acknowledge his sisters. Penelope followed Lady Bridgerton's wave to a nearby chair and took a seat. Biscuits are good, Hyacinth said, thrusting a plate in her direction. Hyacinth, Lady Bridgerton said in a vaguely disapproving voice. Do try to speak in complete sentences. Hyacinth looked at her mother with a surprised expression. Biscuits. Ah, good. She cocked her head to the side. Noun. Verb. Adjective. Hyacinth. Penelope could see that Lady Bridgerton was trying to look stern as she scolded her daughter. But she wasn't quite succeeding. Noun. Verb. Adjective. Colin said, wiping a crumb from his grinning face. Sentence. Is. Correct. If you're barely literate, Kate retorted, reaching for a biscuit. These are good, she said to Penelope, a sheepish smile crossing her face. This one's my fourth. I love you, Colin, Hyacinth said. Ignoring Kate completely, of course you do, he murmured. I myself, Eloise said archly, prefer to place articles before my nouns. In my own writings, Hyacinth snorted. Your writings, she echoed. I write many letters, Eloise said with a sniff. And I keep a journal, which I assure you is a very beneficial habit. It does keep one disciplined, Penelope put in. Taking her cup and saucer from Lady Bridgerton's outstretched hands. Do you keep a journal, Kate? Asked, not really looking at her, since. She had just jumped up from her chair to grasp her daughter. Before the two-year-old climbed on a side table, I'm afraid not, Penelope said with a shake of her head. It requires far too much discipline for me. I don't think it is always necessary. To put an article before a noun, Hyacinth persisted, completely unable, as always, to let her side of the argument go. Unfortunately, for the rest of the assemblage, Eloise was equally tenacious. You may leave off the article if you are referring to your noun. In a general sense, she said, pursing her lips in a rather supercilious manner. But in this case, as you were referring to specific biscuits, Penelope wasn't positive, but she thought she heard Lady Bridgerton groan. Then specifically, Eloise said with an arch of her brows, You are incorrect. Hyacinth turned to Penelope. I am positive she did not use specifically correctly in that last sentence. Penelope reached for another butter biscuit. I refused to enter the conversation. Coward, Colin murmured, no, just hungry.
Penelope turned to Kate. These are good. Kate nodded her agreements. I have heard rumors. She said to Penelope. That your sister may become betrothed. Penelope blinked in surprise. She hadn't thought that Felicity's connection to Mr. Albansdale was public knowledge. Uh, where have you heard rumors, Eloise? Of course, Kate said matter-of-factly. She always knows everything. And what I don't know, Eloise said with an easy grin. Hyacinth usually does. It's very convenient. Are you certain that neither one of you is Lady Whistledown? Colin joked. Colin. Lady Bridgerton exclaimed. How could you even think such a thing? He shrugged. They're certainly both smart enough to carry off such a feat. Eloise and Hyacinth beamed. Even Lady Bridgerton couldn't quite dismiss the compliment. Yes, well, she hemmed. Hyacinth is much too young, and Eloise, she looked over at Eloise, who was watching her with a most amused expression. Well, Eloise is not Lady Whistledown. I'm sure of it. Eloise looked at Colin. I'm not Lady Whistledown. That's the bad, he replied. You'd be filthy rich by now, I imagine. You know, Penelope said thoughtfully. That might be a good way to disown her identity. Five pairs of eyes turned in her direction. She has to be someone who has more money than she ought to have. Penelope explained. A good point, Hyacinth said. Except that I haven't a clue how much money people ought to have. Neither do I. Of course, Penelope replied, but most of the time Onehos a general idea. A Tyacinth's blank stare, she added, for example. If I suddenly went out and bought myself a diamond parole, that would be very suspect. Kate nudged Penelope with her elbow. Bought any diamond paroles lately? A. Eh, I could use a thousand pounds. Penelope let her eyes roll up for a second before replying. Because, as the current Viscountess Bridgerton, Kate most certainly did not need a thousand pounds. I can assure you, she said. I don't own a single diamond, not even a ring. Kate let out a youth of mock disgruntlement. Well, you're no help, then. It's not so much the money. Hyacinth announced. It's the glory. Lady Bridgerton coughed on her tea. I'm sorry, Hyacinth, she said. But what did you just say? Think of the accolades one would receive for having finally caught Lady Whistledown. Hyacinth said, It would be glorious, are you saying? Colin asked, a deceptively bland expression on his face, that you don't care about the money. I would never say that. Hyacinth said with a cheeky grin, It occurred to Penelope that of all the Bridgertons, Hyacinth and Colin were the most alike. It was probably a good thing Colin was so often out of the country. If he and Hyacinth ever joined forces in earnest, they could probably take over the world. Hyacinth, Lady Bridgerton said firmly, You are not to make the search. For Lady Whistledown your life's work, but I'm not saying you cannot ponder the problem and ask a few questions. Lady Bridgerton hastened to add, holding up one hand to ward off further interruptions, good gracious. I would hope that after nearly forty years of motherhood, I would know better than to try to stop you when you have your mind quite so set on something. Nonsense as it may be. Penelope brought her teacup to her mouth to cover her smile. It's just that you have been known to. Be rather. Lady Bridgerton delicately cleared her throat. Single-minded at times, mother, Lady Bridgerton continued as if Hyacinth had never spoken. And I do not want you to forget that your primary focus at this time just be to look for a husband. Hyacinth uttered the word mother again. But this time it was more of a groan than a protest. Penelope stole a glance at Eloise, who had her eyes fixed on the ceiling, and was clearly trying not to break out in a grin. Eloise had endured years of relentless matchmaking at her mother's hands, and did not mind in the least that she seemed to have given up and moved on to Hyacinth. In truth, Penelope was surprised that Lady Bridgerton seemed to have finally accepted Eloise's unmarried state. She had never hidden the fact 
that her greatest aim in life was to see all eight of her children happily married, and she'd succeeded with four. First Daphne had married Simon and become the Duchess of Hastings. The following year Anthony had married Kate. There'd been a bit of a lull after that. But both Benedict and Francesca had married within a year of each other, Benedict to Sophie, and Francesca to the Scottish Earl of Kilmartin. Francesca, unfortunately, had been widowed only two years after her marriage. She now divided her time between her late husband's family in Scotland and her own in London. When in town, however, she insisted upon living at Kilmartin House instead of at Bridgerton House or Number 5. Penelope didn't blame her. If she were a widow, she'd want to enjoy all of her independence, too. Hyacinth generally bore her mother's matchmaking, with good humour since, as she had told Penelope. It wasn't as if she didn't want to get married eventually. Might as well let her mother do all the work, and then she could choose a husband when the right. One presented himself, and it was with this good humour that she stood kissed her mother on the cheek, and dutifully promised that her main focus in life was to look for a husband, all the while directing a cheeky, sneaky smile at her brother and sister. She was barely back in her seat, when she said to the crowd at large, So, do you think she'll be caught? Are we still discussing that whistle-down woman? Lady Bridgerton groaned, Have you not heard Eloise's theory? Then, Penelope asked, all eyes turned to Penelope, then to Eloise, ah. Uh, what is my theory? Eloise asked. It was just, oh, I don't know, maybe a week ago, Penelope said. We were talking about Lady Whistledown, and I said that I didn't see how she could possibly go on forever, that eventually she would have to make a mistake. Then Eloise said she wasn't so sure, that it had been over ten years, and if she were going to make a mistake, wouldn't she have already done so? Then I said, no, she was only human. Eventually she would have to slip up, because no one could go on forever, and, oh, I remember now. Eloise cut in. We were at your house, in your room. I had the most brilliant idea. I said to Penelope that I would wager that Lady Whistledown has already made a mistake and it's just we were too stupid to have noticed it. Not very complimentary for us. I must say, Colin murmured, well, I did intend we two mean all of society, not just us bridge. Eloise demurred, so maybe, Hyacinth mused, all I need to do to catch Lady Whistledown is peruse back issues of her column. Lady Bridgerton's eyes filled with a mild panic. Hyacinth Bridgerton, I don't like the look on your face, Hyacinth smiled and shrugged. I could have a great deal of fun with one thousand pounds. God help us all, was her mother's reply, Penelope, Colin said quite suddenly. You never did finish telling us about Felicity. Is it true that she is to be engaged? Penelope gulped down the tea. She'd been in the process of sipping. Colin had a way of looking at a person his green eyes so focused and intent that you felt as if you must be the only two people in the universe. Unfortunately for Penelope, it also seemed to have a way of reducing her to a stammering imbecile. If they were in the midst of conversation, she could generally hold her own, but when he surprised her like that, turning his attention onto her just when she'd convinced herself, she blended in perfectly with the wallpaper. She was completely and utterly lost. Uh, yes, it is quite possible, she said. Mr. Albansdale has been hinting at his intentions, but if he does decide to propose, I imagine he will travel to East Anglia to ask my uncle for her hand. Your uncle? Kate asked. My uncle Geoffrey. He lives near Norwich. He's our closest male relative, although truth be told, we don't see him very often but Mr. Albansdale is rather traditional. I don't think he would feel comfortable asking my mother. I hope he asks Felicity as well, Eloise said. I've often thought it foolish that a man asks a woman's father for her hand before he asks her.
the father doesn't have to live with him. This attitude, Colin said with an amused smile that was only partly hidden by his teacup, may explain why you are as yet unmarried. Lady Bridgerton gave her son a stern glare and said his name disapprovingly. Oh, no, mother, Eloise said. I don't mind. I'm perfectly comfortable as an old maid. She gave Colin a rather superior look. I'd much rather be a spinster than be married to a boar, as, she added with a flourish, would Penelope. Startled by Eloise's hand waving rather suddenly in her direction, Penelope straightened her spine and said, Uh, yes, of course. But Penelope had a feeling she wasn't quite as firm. In her convictions as her friend, unlike Eloise, she hadn't refused six offers of marriage. She hadn't refused any. She hadn't received even a one. She'd told herself that she wouldn't have accepted in any case, since her heart belonged to Colin. But was that really the truth? Or was she just trying to make herself feel better for having been such a resounding failure on the marriage mart? If someone asked her to marry him tomorrow someone perfectly kind and acceptable, whom she might never love, but would in all probability like very well would she say yes eh probably. And this made her melancholy, because admitting this to herself meant she'd really, truly given up hope on Colin. It meant she wasn't as true to her principles as she'd hoped she was. It meant she was willing to settle on a less than perfect husband. In order to have a home and family of her own dot, it wasn't anything that hundreds of women didn't do. Every year. But it was something that she'd never thought she'd do herself. You look very serious all of a sudden, Colin said to her. Penelope jerked out of her musings. Me. Oh, no. No, I just lost myself in my thoughts, that's all. Colin acknowledged her statement with a brief nod. Before reaching for another biscuit, have we anything more substantial, he asked. Wrinkling his nose, if I'd known you were coming, his mother said in a dry voice, I would have doubled the food. He stood and walked to the bell pull. I'll ring for more. After giving it a yank, he turned back and asked, did you hear about Penelope's Lady Whistledown theory? No, I haven't. Lady Bridgerton replied. It's very clever, actually, Colin said, stopping to ask a maid for sandwiches. Before finishing with, she thinks it's Lady Danbury. Ooh. Hyacinth was visibly impressed. That's very cunning, Penelope. Penelope nodded her head to the side in thanks and just the sort of thing Lady Danbury would do, Hyacinth added. The column or the challenge, Kate asked, catching hold of the sash and Charlotte's frock before the little girl could scramble out of reach. Both, Hyacinth said, and Eloise put in. Penelope told her so, right to her face. Hyacinth's mouth dropped open, and it was obvious to Penelope that she'd just gone up way up. In Hyacinth's estimation, I should have liked to have seen that, Lady Bridgerton said with a wide, proud smile, frankly, I'm surprised that didn't show up in this morning's whistle down. I hardly think Lady Whistledown would comment upon individual people's theories as to her identity, Penelope said, why not? Hyacinth asked, it would be an excellent way for her to set out a few red herrings, for example, she held her hand out toward her sister in a most dramatic pose. Say I thought it was Eloise, it is not Eloise. Lady Bridgerton protested. It's not me, Eloise said with a grin, but say I thought it was. Hyacinth said in an extremely beleaguered voice, and that I said so publicly, which you would never do, her mother said sternly. Which I would never do, Hyacinth parroted. But just to be academic, let us pretend that I did and say that Eloise really was Lady Whistledam, which she's not. She hastened to add before her mother could interrupt again. Lady Bridgerton held up her hands in. Silent defeat. What better way to fool the masses, Hyacinth continued, than to make fun of me in her column, of course, if Lady Whistledam really were Eloise. Penelope mused, she's not.
Lady Bridgerton burst out. Penelope couldn't help but laugh. But if she were, you know. Now I really wish I were. What a joke you'd be having on us all. Penelope continued, of course. Then on Wednesday you couldn't run a column making fun of Hyacinth. For thinking you are Lady Whistledown. Because then we'd all know it had to be you. Unless it was you, Kate laughed, looking at Penelope. That would be a devious trick. Let me see if I have it straight, Eloise said with a laugh. Penelope is Lady Whistledown, and she's going to run a column on Wednesday making fun of Hyacinth's theory. That I'm Lady Whistledown just to trick you into thinking. That I really am Lady Whistledown, because Hyacinth suggested that that would be a cunning ruse. I am utterly lost. Colin said to no one in particular, unless Colin were really Lady Whistledown. Hyacinth said with a devilish gleam in her eye. Stop, Lady Bridgerton said, I beg you. By then everyone was laughing too hard for Hyacinth to continue, anyway. The possibilities are endless, Hyacinth said, wiping a tear from her eye. Perhaps we should all simply look to the left. Colin suggested, as he sat back down, who knows? That person may very well be our infamous Lady Whistledown. Everyone looked left. With the exception of Eloise, who looked right dot dot, right to Colin. Were you trying to tell me something? She asked with an amused smile, when you sat down to my right. Not at all, he murmured, reaching for the biscuit plate, and then stopping when he remembered it was empty but he didn't quite meet Eloise's eyes when he said so. If anyone other than Penelope had noticed his evasiveness, they were unable to question him on it, because that was when the sandwiches arrived, and he was useless for conversation after that. Chapter 5 It has come to this author's attention that Lady Blackwood turned her ankle earlier this week whilst chasing down a delivery boy. For this humble news sheet dot £1,000 is certainly a great deal of money. But Lady Blackwood is hardly in need of funds, and moreover, the situation is growing absurd. Surely Londoners have better things to do with their time than chase down poor, hapless delivery boys in a fruitless attempt to uncover the identity of this author. Or maybe not. This author has chronicled the activities of the ton for over a decade now, and has found no evidence that they do indeed have anything better to do with their time. Lady Whistledown's Society Papers, 14 April, 18-4 Two days later, Penelope found herself once again cutting across Berkeley Square. On her way to number 5 to see Eloise, this time, however, it was late morning, and it was sunny, and she did not bump into Colin along the way. Penelope wasn't sure is that was a bad thing or not. She and Eloise had made plans the week before to go shopping, but they decided to meet at number five so that they could head out together and forego the accompaniment of their mates. It was a perfect sort of day, far more like June than April, and Penelope was looking forward to the short walk up to Oxford Street, but when she arrived at Eloise's house, she was met with a puzzled expression on the butler's face. Miss Featherington, he said, blinking several times in rapid succession before locating a few more words. I don't believe Miss Eloise is here at present. Penelope's lips parted in surprise. Where did she go? We made our plans over a week ago. Wickham shook his head. I do not know. But she departed with her mother and Miss Hyacinth two hours earlier. I see, Penelope frowned, trying to decide what to do. May I wait? Then, perhaps, she was merely delayed. It's not like Eloise to forget an appointment. He nodded graciously, and showed her upstairs to the informal drawing room, promising to bring a plate of refreshments, and handing her the latest edition of Whistle Down to read. While she bided her time, Dot Penelope had already read it, of course. It was delivered quite early in the morning and she made a habit of perusing the column at breakfast, with so little to occupy her mind. She wandered over to the window, and peered out over the Mayfair streetscape, but there wasn't much new to see.
It was the same buildings she'd seen a thousand times before. Even the same people walking along the street. Maybe it was because she was pondering the sameness of her life that she noticed the one object new to her vista. A bound book lying open on the table. Even from several feet away she could see that it was filled not with the printed word, but rather with neat handwritten lines. She inched toward it and glanced down without actually touching the pages. It appeared to be a journal of sorts, and in the middle of the right, hand side, there was a heading that was set apart from the rest of the text by a bit of space above and below. The 22nd of February, 1824 Trudeau's Mountains. Cypress own of her hands flew to her mouth. Colin had written this. He'd said just the other day that he'd visited Cyprus instead of Greece. She had no idea that he kept a journal. She lifted a foot to take a step back, but her body didn't budge. She shouldn't read this, she told herself. This was Colin's private journal. She really ought to move away. Away, she muttered, looking down at her recalcitrant feet. Away, her feet didn't move, but maybe she wasn't quite so in the wrong, after all. Was she real invading his privacy if she read only what she could see without turning a page? He had left it lying open on the table, for all the world to see. But then again, Colin had every reason to think that no one would stumble across his journal if he dashed out for a few moments, presumably. He was aware that his mother and sisters had departed for the morning. Most guests were shown to the formal drawing room on the ground floor, as far as Penelope knew. She and Felicity were the only non Bridgertons who were taken straight up to the informal drawing room, and since Colin wasn't expecting her or, more likely, hadn't thought of her, one way or another, he wouldn't have thought there was any danger in leaving his journal behind while he ran an errand. On the other hand, he had left it lying open, open, for heaven's sake. If there were any valuable secrets in that journal, surely Colin would have taken greater care to secret it. When he left the room, he wasn't stupid, after all. Penelope leaned forward. Oh, bother. She couldn't read the writing from that distance. The heading had been legible, since it was surrounded by so much white space, but the rest was a bit too close together to make, out from far away. Somehow she'd thought she wouldn't feel so guilty, if she didn't have to step any closer to the book to read it, never mind, of course, that she'd already crossed the room to get to where she was at. That moment dot, she tapped her finger against the side of her jaw, right near her ear. That was a good point. She had crossed the room some time ago, which surely meant that she'd already committed the biggest sin she was likely to that day. One little step was nothing compared to the length of the room. She inched forward, decided that only counted as half a step, then inched forward again and looked down, beginning her reading right in the middle of a sentence dot in England, here the sand ripples between tan and white, and the consistency is so fine that it slides over a bare foot like a whisper of silk. The water is a blue unimaginable in England, aquamarine with the glint of the sun, deep cobalt when the clouds take the sky, and it is warm surprisingly, astoundingly warm, like a bath that was heated perhaps a half an hour earlier. The waves are gentle, and they lap up on the shore with a soft rush of foam, tickling the skin and turning the perfect sand into a squishy delight that slips and slides along the toes, until another wave arrives to clean up the mess dot. It is easy to see why this is said to be the birthplace of Aphrodite. With every step I almost expect to see her, as in Botticelli's painting, rising from the ocean, perfectly balanced on a giant shell her long Titian hair streaming around her. If ever a perfect woman was born, surely this would be the place. I am in paradise, and yet, and yet with every warm breeze, and cloudless sky I am reminded that this is not my home, that I was born to live my life elsewhere.
This does not quell the desire, no, the compulsion. To travel, to see, to meet, but it does feed a strange longing to touch a dew-dampened lawn. Or feel a cool mist on one's face. Or even to remember the joy of a perfect day after a week of rain. The people here can't know that joy. Their days are always perfect. Can one appreciate perfection when it is a constant in one's life? The 22nd of February 1824 Trudeau's Mountains, Cyprus It is remarkable that I am cold. It is, of course, February. And as an Englishman, I, I ain't used to a February chill as well as that of any month. With an R in its name. But I am not in England. I am in Cyprus, in the heart of the Mediterranean. And just two days ago I was in Paphos. On the southwest coast of the island, where the sun is strong and the ocean salty and warm, here, one can see the peak of Mount Olympus, still capped with snow so white one is temporarily blinded. When the sun glints off of it, the climb to this altitude was treacherous. With danger lurking around more than one corner, the road is rudimentary, and along the way we met, Penelope let out a soft grunt of protest when she realised that the page ended in the middle of a sentence, who had he met, what had happened, what danger. She stared down at the journal, absolutely dying to flip the page and see what happened next, but when she'd started reading, she had managed to justify it by telling herself. She wasn't really invading Colin's privacy, he'd left the book open. After all, she was only looking at what he had left exposed, turning the page, however, was something else altogether. She reached out, then yanked her hand back. This wasn't right. She couldn't read his journal, well, not beyond what she'd already read. On the other hand, it was clear that these were words worth reading. It was a crime for Colin to keep them for himself. Words should be celebrated, shared, they should be low, for God's sake, she muttered to herself. She reached for the edge of the page. What are you doing? Penelope whirled around. Colin, indeed, he snapped. Penelope lurched back. She'd never heard him use such a tone. She hadn't even thought him capable of it. He strode across the room, grabbed the journal, and snapped it shut. What are you doing here? he demanded. Waiting for Eloise, she managed to get out her mouth suddenly quite dry. In the upstairs drawing room, Wickham always takes me here. Your mother told him to treat me like family, either. He. She realised that she was wringing her hands. Together and willed herself to stop. It's the same with my sister Felicity. Because she and Hyacinth are such good friends, I am sorry. I thought you knew. He threw the leather-bound book carelessly onto a nearby chair and crossed his arms. And do you make a habit of reading the personal letters of others? No. Of course not. But it was open and... She gulped. Recognising how awful the excuse sounded, the second the words left her lips, it's a public room. She mumbled, somehow feeling like she had to finish her defence. Maybe you should have taken it with you. Where I went, he ground out, still visibly furious with her. One doesn't ordinarily take a book. It's not very big, she said, wondering why 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 she was still talking when she was so clearly in the wrong. For the love of God, he exploded. Do you want me to say the word chamber pot in your presence? Penelope felt her cheeks blush deep. Red. I'd better go, she said. Please tell Eloise, I'll go. Colin practically snarled. I'm moving out this afternoon, anyway. Might as well leave now. Since you've so obviously taken over the house, Penelope had never thought that words could cause physical pain. But right then she would have sworn that she'd taken a knife to the heart. She hadn't realised until that very moment just how much it meant to her that Lady Bridgerton had opened her home to her or how much it would hurt to know that Colin resented her presence there. Why do you have to make it so difficult to apologise? She burst out, 
dogging his heels as he crossed the room to gather the rest of his things and why. Pray tell, should I make it easy? He returned. He didn't face her as he said it. He didn't even break his stride. Because it would be the nice thing to do, she ground out. That got his attention, he whirled around. His eyes flashing so furiously that Penelope stumbled back a step. Colin was the nice one. The easy-going one. He didn't lose his temper dot until now. Because it would be the nice thing to do, he thundered. Is that what you were thinking when you read my journal? That it would be a nice thing to read someone's private papers? No, Colin, I. There is nothing you can say, he said, jabbing her in the shoulder with his index finger. Colin, you. He turned around to gather his belongings, rudely giving her his back while he spoke. Not a thing that could justify your behavior. No. Of course not, but... O.W. Penelope felt the blood drain from her face. Colin's yell was one of real pain. His name escaped her lips in a panicked whisper, and she rushed to his side. What's? Oh, my heavens. Blood was gushing from a wound on the palm of his hand, never terribly articulate in a crisis. Penelope managed to say, Oh, do, the carpet before leaping forward with a piece of writing paper that had been lying on a nearby table and sliding it under his hand to catch the blood, before it ruined the priceless carpet below. Ever the attentive nurse, Colin said in a shaky voice, Well, you're not going to die, she explained. And the carpet, it's all right, he assured her. I was trying to make a joke. Penelope looked up at his face. Tight white lines were etched in the skin around his mouth, and he looked very pale. I think you'd better sit down, she said. He nodded grimly and sacked. Into a chair. Penelope's stomach did a rather seasickish sway. She'd never been terribly good with blood. Maybe I'd better sit down, too, she mumbled, sinking onto the low table opposite him. Are you going to be all right? he asked, she nodded swallowing against a tiny wave of nausea. We need to find something to wrap this, she said, grimacing as she looked down at the ridiculous setup below. The paper wasn't absorbent, and the blood was rolling precariously along its surface, with Penelope desperately trying to keep it from dripping over the side. I have a handkerchief in my pocket, he said. She carefully set the paper down and retrieved the handkerchief from his breast pocket trying not to notice the warm beat of his heart. As her fingers fumbled for the creamy white scrap of cloth, does it hurt? She asked as she wrapped it around his hand. No, don't answer that. Of course it hurts. He managed a very wobbly smile. It hurts. She peered down at the gash, forcing herself to look at it closely, even though the blood made her stomach turn. I don't think. You'll need stitches. Do you know much about wounds? She shook her head. Nothing. But it doesn't look too bad, except for, ah, all the blood, feels worse than it looks. He joked. Her eyes flew to his face in horror. Another joke. He reassured her. Well, not really. It does. Feel worse than it looks. But I assure you it's bearable. I'm sorry, she said. Increasing pressure on the wound to staunch the flow of blood. This is all my fault. That I sliced open my hand. If you hadn't been so angry, he just shook his head, closing his eyes briefly against the pain. Don't be silly, Penelope. If I hadn't gotten angry with you, I would have gotten angry with someone else some other time. And you'd of course have a letter opener by your side when that happened. She murmured, looking up at him through her lashes as she bent over his hand. When his eyes met hers, they were filled with humour and maybe just a touch of admiration, and something else she'd never thought to see vulnerability, hesitancy, and even insecurity. He didn't know how good his writing was, she realised with amazement. He had no idea, and he was actually embarrassed that she'd seen it, Colin. Penelope said, instinctively pressing harder on his wound as she leaned in, 
I must tell you, you. She broke off when she heard the sharp, even clatter of footsteps coming down the hall. That will be Wickham, she said, glancing toward the door. He insisted upon bringing me a small meal. Can you keep the pressure on this four now? Colin nodded. I don't want him to know I've hurt myself. He'll on light our mother, and then I'll never hear the end of it. Well, here, then, she stood and tossed him his journal. Pretend you're reading this. Colin barely had time to open it, and lay it across his injured hand before. The butler entered with a large tray, Wickham, Penelope said, jumping to her feet and turning to face him. As if she hadn't already known he was coming. As usual you've brought far more than I could possibly eat. Luckily, Mr. Bridgerton has been keeping me company. I'm certain that with his help, I'll be able to do justice to your meal. Wickham nodded and removed the covers from the serving dishes. It was a cold repast pieces of meat, cheese and fruit, accompanied by a tall pitcher of lemonade. Penelope smiled brightly. I hope you didn't think I could eat all of this myself. Lady Bridgerton and her daughters are expected soon. I thought they might be hungry as well. Won't be any left after I'm through with it. Cullen said with a jovial smile. Wickham bowed slightly in his direction. If I'd known you were here, Mr. Bridgerton, I would have troubled the portions. Would you like me to fix you a plate? No, no, Colin said, waving his uninjured hand. I'll get up just as soon as I, dot R, finish reading this chapter. The butler said, let me know if you require further assistance, and exited the room. R, R, Colin groaned. The moment he heard Wickham's steps disappear down the hall. Damn I mean, dash it it hurts. Penelope plucked a napkin off the tray. Here, let's replace that handkerchief. She peeled it away from his skin, keeping her eyes on the cloth rather than the wound. For some reason that didn't seem to bother her stomach. Quite as much, I'm afraid your handkerchief is ruined. Colin just closed his eyes and shook his head. Penelope was smart enough to interpret the action to mean, I don't care, and she was sensible enough not to say. Anything further on the subject? Nothing worse than a female who chattered forever about nothing. He'd always liked Penelope. But how was it he'd never realised how intelligent she was up till now? Oh, he supposed if someone had asked him, he would have said she was bright but he'd certainly never taken the time to think about it. It was becoming clear to him, however, that she was very intelligent, indeed, and he thought he remembered his sister, once telling him that she was an avid reader, and probably a discriminating one as well. I think the bleeding is slowing down, she was saying as she wrapped the fresh napkin around his hand. In fact, I'm sure it is. If only because I don't feel quite so sick, Every time I look at the wound, he wished that she hadn't read his journal. But now that she had. Ah, Penelope, he began, startled by the hesitancy in his own voice. She looked up. I'm sorry, am I pressing too hard? For a moment Colin did nothing but blink. How is it possible he'd never noticed how big her eyes were? He'd known they were brown, of course, and no. Come to think of it, if he were to be honest with himself, he would have to admit that if asked earlier this morning, he'd not have been able to identify the colour of her eyes. But somehow he knew that he'd never forget again. She eased up on the pressure. Is this all right? He nodded. Thank you. I would do it myself, but it's my right hand, and say no more. It's the very least I can do. After. After. Her eyes slid slightly to the side, and he knew she was about to apologise another time. Penelope, he began again. No. Wait, she cried out, her dark eyes flashing with, could it be passion? Certainly not the brand of passion with which he was most familiar, but there were other sorts. Weren't there? Passion for learning. Passion for dot dot, literature. I must tell you this, she said urgently. 
I know it was unforgivably intrusive of me. To look at your journal, I was just bored and waiting, and I had nothing to do. And then I saw the book and I was curious. He opened his mouth to interrupt her, to tell her that what was done was done. But the words were rushing from her mouth, and he found himself oddly compelled to listen. I should have stepped away the moment I realised what it was, she continued. But as soon as I read one sentence I had to read another, colon, it was wonderful. It was just like I was there. I could feel the water, I knew exactly the temperature. It was so clever of you to describe it the way you did. Everyone knows exactly what a bath feels like a half an hour after it has been filled. For a moment Colin could do nothing but stare at her. He'd never seen Penelope quite so animated. And it was strange, and good, really, that all that excitement was over his journal. You, you liked it, he finally asked, liked it, colon. I loved it, I, ow, in her excitement, she'd started squeezing his hand a bit too hard. Oh, sorry, she said perfunctorily, colon, I really must know. What was the danger? I couldn't bear to be left hanging like that. It was nothing, he said modestly. The page you read really wasn't a very exciting passage, no. It was mostly description. She agreed. But the description was very compelling and evocative. I could see everything, but it wasn't, oh dear, how do I explain this? Colin discovered that he was very impatient for her to figure out what she was trying to say. Sometimes, she finally continued. When one reads a passage of description, it's rather, oh, I don't know, detached clinical, even, you brought the island to life. Other people might call the water warm, but you related it to something we all know and understand. It made me feel as if I were there. Dipping my toe in right alongside you, Colin smiled, ridiculously pleased by her praise, oh, and I don't want to forget there was another brilliant thing I wanted to mention. Now he knew he must be grinning like an idiot. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. What a good word. Penelope leaned in slightly as she said. You also showed the reader how you relate to the scene and how it affects you. It becomes more than mere description because we see how you react to it. Colin knew he was fishing for compliments, but he didn't much care as he asked. But he didn't much care as he asked. What do you mean? Well, if you look at may I see the journal to refresh my memory. Of course, he murmured, handing it to her. Wait, let me find the correct page again. Once he had done so, she scanned his lines until she found the section she was looking for. Here we are. Look at this part about how you are reminded that England is your home. It's funny how travel can do that to a person. Do what to a person, she asked, her eyes wide with interest. Make one appreciate home, he said softly. Her eyes met his, and they were serious, inquisitive. And yet you still like to go away, he nodded. I can't help it. It's like a disease, she laughed. And it sounded unexpectedly musical. Don't be ridiculous, she said. A disease is harmful. It's clear that your travels feed your soul. She looked down to his hand carefully peeling the napkin back to inspect his wound. It's almost better, she said. Almost. He agreed. In truth, he suspected the bleeding had stopped altogether. But he was reluctant to let the conversation end, and he knew that the moment she was done caring for him, she would go. He didn't think she wanted to go, but he somehow knew that she would. She'd think it was the proper thing to do and she'd probably also think it was what he wanted. Nothing, he was surprised to realise, could be further from the truth, and nothing could have scared him more. Chapter 6 Everyone has secrets, especially me. Lady Whistledown's Society Papers, 14 April, 18-4 I wish I'd known you kept a journal, Penelope said, reapplying pressure to his palm. Why? I'm not sure, she said with a shrug. It's always interesting to find out.
that there is more to someone than meets the eye. Don't you think? Colin didn't say anything for several moments. And then, quite suddenly, he blurted out, You really liked it. She looked amused. He was horrified. Here he was. Considered one of the most popular and sophisticated men of the ton, and he'd been reduced to a bashful schoolboy, hanging on Penelope Featherington's every word. Just for a single scrap of praise, Penelope Featherington. For God's sake, not that there was anything wrong with Penelope, of course. He hastened to remind himself, just that she was, well. Penelope, of course I liked it, she said with a soft smile. I just finished telling you so. What was the first thing that struck you about it, he asked, deciding that he might as well act like a complete fool. Since he was already more than halfway there, she smiled wickedly, actually. The first thing that struck me was that your penmanship was quite a bit neater than... Than I would have guessed, he frowned. What does that mean? I have difficulty seeing you bent over a desk, practicing your flicks, she replied, her lips tightening at the corners. To suppress a smile, if ever there were a time for righteous indignation, this was clearly it. I'll have you know I spent many an hour in the nursery schoolroom, bent over a desk, as you so delicately put it. I'm sure, she murmured, H-M-M-M-P-H. She looked down, clearly trying not to smile. I'm quite good with my flicks, he added. It was just a game now. But somehow it was rather fun. To play the part of the petulant schoolboy, obviously, she replied. I especially like them on the H's. Very well, Donny. Quite. Flicky of you. Indeed. She matched his straight face perfectly. Indeed. His gaze slid from hers. And for a moment he felt quite unaccountably shy. I'm glad you liked the journal, he said. It was lovely, she said in a soft, faraway kind of voice. Very lovely. And she looked away. Blushing, you're going to think I'm silly. Never, he promised. Well, I think one of the reasons I enjoyed it so much is that I could somehow feel that you'd enjoyed writing it. Colin was silent for a long moment. It hadn't ever occurred to him that he enjoyed his writing. It was just something he did. He did it because he couldn't imagine not doing it. How could he travel to foreign lands and not keep a record of what he saw, what he experienced, and perhaps most importantly, what he felt, but when he thought back, he realised that he felt a strange rush of satisfaction whenever he wrote a phrase that was exactly right. A sentence that was particularly true. He distinctly remembered the moment he'd written the passage Penelope had read. He'd been sitting on the beach at dusk, the sun still warm on his skin. The sand somehow rough and smooth at the same time under his bare feet. It had been a heavenly moment full of that warm, lazy feeling one can truly only experience in the dead of summer, or on the perfect beaches of the Mediterranean, and he'd been trying to think of the exact right way to describe the water. He'd sat there for ages surely, a full half an hour his pen poised above the paper of his journal, waiting for inspiration, and then suddenly he'd realised the temperature was precisely that of slightly old bathwater, and his face had broken into a wide, delighted smile. Yes, he enjoyed writing. Funny how he'd never realised it before. It's good to have something in your life, Penelope said quietly. Something satisfying that will fill the hours. With a sense of purpose, she crossed her hands in her lap and looked down, seemingly engrossed. By her knuckles, I've never understood the supposed joys of a lazy life. Colin wanted to touch his fingers to her chin. To see her eyes when he asked her and, what do you do to fill your hours? With a sense of purpose, but he didn't, it would be far too forward. And it would mean admitting to himself. Just how interested he was in her answer dot, so he asked the question. And he kept his own hands still. Nothing, really, she replied still examining her fingernails. Then, after a pause, 
She looked up quite suddenly, her chin rising so quickly it almost made him dizzy. I like to read, she said. I read quite a bit, actually. And I do a bit of embroidery now and then, but I'm not very good at it. I wish there were more, but, well, what, Colin prodded. Penelope shook her head. It's nothing. You should be grateful for your travels. I'm quite envious of you. There was a long silence. Not awkward, but strange nonetheless. And finally Colin said brusquely, It's not enough. The tone of his voice seemed so out of place. In the conversation, that Penelope could do nothing but stare. What do you mean? She finally asked Dotty shrugged carelessly. A man can't travel forever. To do so would take all the fun out of it, she laughed. Then looked at him and realised he was serious. I'm sorry, she said. I didn't mean to be rude. You weren't rude, he said, taking a swig of his lemonade. It slashed on the table when he set the glass down. Clearly, he was unused to using his left hand. Two of the best parts of travel. He explained, wiping his mouth with one of the clean napkins, are the leaving and the coming home. And besides, I'd miss my family too much were I to go off indefinitely. Penelope had no reply, at least nothing, that wouldn't sound like platitudes. So she just waited for him to continue. For a moment, he didn't say anything. Then he scoffed and shut his journal with a resounding thud. These don't count. They're just for me. They don't have to be, she said softly dot if he heard her. He made no indication. It's all very well and good to keep a journal while you're travelling, he continued. But once I'm home, I still have nothing to do. I find that difficult to believe. He didn't say anything, just reached for a piece of cheese off the tray. She watched him while he ate. And then, after he'd washed it down with more lemonade, his entire demeanour changed. He seemed more alert, more on edge as he asked. Have you read Whistle Down lately? Penelope blinked at the sudden change of subject. Yes. Of course. Why? Doesn't everyone read it? He waved off her question. Have you noticed how she describes me? Uh, it's almost always favourable. Isn't it? His hand began to wave again rather dismissively. In her opinion, yes, yes, that's not the point, he said in a distracted voice. You might think it more the point. Penelope replied testily, if you'd ever been likened to an overripe citrus fruit. He winced, and he opened and closed his mouth twice before finale saying, if it makes you feel better. I didn't remember that she'd called you that until just now. He stopped, thought for a moment, then added, In fact, I still don't remember it. It's all right, she said, putting on her best I'm a good sport face. I assure you, I'm quite beyond it. And I've always had a fondness for oranges and lemons. He started to say something again, then stopped, then looked at her rather directly and said, I hope what I'm about to say isn't abominably insensitive or insulting, given that when all is said and done, I've very little to complain about. The implication being, Penelope realised, that perhaps she did, but I'm telling you, he continued, his eyes clear and earnest, because I think maybe you'll understand, it was a compliment, a strange, uncommon one, but a compliment nonetheless. Penelope wanted nothing more than to lay her hand across his, but of course she could not, so she just nodded and said, You can tell me anything, Colin. My brother's tea began. There, he stopped, staring rather blankly toward the window before finally turning back to her and saying, They're very accomplished. Anthony is the Viscount. And God knows I wouldn't want that responsibility, but he has a purpose. Our entire heritage is in his hands, more than that. I should think... Penelope said softly. He looked at her, question in his eyes. I think your brother feels responsible for your entire family. She said, I imagine it's a heavy burden. Colin tried to keep his face impassive, but he'd never been an accomplished stoic, and he must have shown his dismay on his face. 
Because Penelope practically rose from her seat as she rushed to add, Not that I think he minds it. It's part of who he is, exactly, Colin exclaimed, as if he'd just discovered something. That was actually important, as opposed to this, this, this inane discussion about his life. He had nothing to complain about. He knew he had nothing to complain about. And yet, did you know Benedict Paints? He found himself asking. Of course, she replied. Everyone knows he paints. He has a painting in the National Gallery. And I believe they are planning to hang another soon. Another landscape, really, she nodded. Eloise told me. He slumped again. Then it must be true. I can't believe no one mentioned it too. Me. You have been away. She reminded him. What I'm trying to say. He continued. Is that they both have a purpose to their lives. I have nothing. That can't be true, she said. I should think I would be in a position to know. Penelope sat back. Startled by the sharp tone of his voice. I know what people think of me, he began. And although Penelope had told herself that she was going to remain silent, to allow him to speak his mind fully, she couldn't help but interrupt. Everyone likes you, she rushed to say. They adore you, I know, he groaned, looking anguished. And sheepish at the same time, but... He raked a hand through his hair. God, how to say this without sounding a complete ass? Penelope's eyes widened. I'm sick of being thought an empty-headed charmer, he finally blurted out. Don't be silly, she said, faster than immediately. If that were possible, Penelope, no one thinks you're stupid. She said, how would? Because I've been stuck here in London for more years than anyone should have to. She said sharply, I may not be the most popular woman in town, but after ten years, I've heard more than my fair share of gossip and lies and foolish opinions. And I have never not once heard someone refer to you as stupid. He stared at her for a moment, a bit startled by her passionate defence. I didn't mean stupid, precisely, he said in a soft. And he hoped humble, voice, more, without substance. Even Lady Whistledown refers to me as a charmer. What's wrong with that? Nothing. He replied testily, if she didn't do it every other day, she only publishes every other day, my point exactly, he, shot back, if she thought there was anything to, me other than my so-called legendary charm, don't you think she would have said so by now? Penelope was quiet for a long moment, then she said, does it really matter what Lady Whistledam thinks, he slumped forward smacking his hands against his knees, then yelping with pain when he belatedly remembered his injury. You're missing the point, he said, wincing as he reapplied pressure to his palm. I couldn't care less about Lady Whistledown, but whether we like it or not. She represents the rest of society. I would imagine that there are quite a few people who would take exception to that statement. He raised one brow, including yourself, Actually, I think Lady Whistledown is rather astute, she said, folding her hands primly in her lap. The woman called you an overripe melon. To splotches of red burned in her cheeks, an overripe citrus fruit, she ground out. I assure you, there is a very big difference. Colin decided then, and there that the female mind was a strange and incomprehensible organ one, which no man should even attempt to understand. There wasn't a woman alive who could go from pointer to B without stopping at C, D, X, and twelve along the way, Penelope, he finally said. Staring at her in disbelief, the woman insulted you. How can you defend her? She said nothing more than the truth, she replied. Crossing her arms over her chest, she's been rather kind, actually. Since my mother started allowing me to pick out my own clothing, Colin groaned. Surely we were talking about something else at some point. Tell me we didn't intend to discuss your wardrobe. Penelope's eyes narrowed. I believe we were discussing your dissatisfaction with life as the most popular man in London. 
Her voice rose on the last four words, and Colin realized he'd been scolded, soundly, which he found extraordinarily irritating. I don't know why I thought you'd understand, he bit off, hating the childish tinge in his voice, but completely unable to edit it out. I'm sorry, she said, but it's a little difficult for me to sit here and listen to you complain that your life is not. I didn't say that. You most certainly did. I said I have nothing, he corrected, trying not to wince as he realized Edo stupid that sounded. You have more than anyone I know, she said, jabbing him in Theeshuda, but if you don't realize that, then maybe you are correct. Your life is nothing. It's too hard to explain. He said in a petulant mutter, If you want a new direction for your life, she said. Then for heaven's sake, just pick something out and do it. The world is your oyster, Colin, you're young, wealthy, and you're a man. You can do anything you want, he scowled. Which didn't surprise her, when people were convinced they had problems. The last thing they wanted to hear was a simple, straightforward solution. It's not that simple, he said. It's exactly that simple. She stared at him for the longest moment, wondering. Perhaps for the first time in her life, just who he was. She'd thought she knew everything about him, but she hadn't known that he kept a journal. She hadn't known that he possessed a temper, she hadn't known that he felt dissatisfied with his life. And she certainly hadn't known that he was petulant and spoiled in auto feel that dissatisfaction, when heaven knew he didn't deserve to. What right did he have to feel unhappy with his life? How dare he complain, especially to her? She stood, smoothing out her skirts in an awkward, defensive gesture. Next time you want to complain about the trials and tribulations of universal adoration, try being an on-the-shelf spinster for a day. See how that feels, and then let me know what you want to complain about. And then, while Colin was still sprawled on the sofa, gaping at her as if she was some bizarre creature, with three heads, twelve fingers, and a tail, she swept out of the room dot it was. She thought as she descended the outer steps to Bruton Street, quite the most splendid exit of her existence. It was really too bad, then, that the man she'd been leaving was the only one in whose company she'd ever wanted to remain. Colin felt like hell all day, his hand hurt like the devil, despite the brandy he'd slashed both on his skin and into his mouth. The estate agent who'd handled the lease, for the snug little terrace house he'd found in Bloomsbury, had informed him that the previous tenant was having difficulties, and Colin wouldn't be able to move in today as planned would next week be acceptable, and to top it off, he suspected that he might have done irreparable harm to his friendship with Penelope, which made him feel worst of all, since a he rather valued his friendship with Penelope, and b he hadn't realised how much he valued his friendship with Penelope, which c made him feel slightly panicked. Penelope was a constant in his life, his sister's friend, the one who was always at the fringes of the party, nearby, but not truly a part of things, but the world seemed to be shifting. He'd only been back in England for a fortnight, but already Penelope had changed, or maybe he'd changed, or maybe she hadn't changed, but the way he saw her had changed. She mattered, he didn't know how else to put it, and after ten years of her just being, there, it was rather bizarre for her to matter quite so much. He didn't like that they'd parted ways, that afternoon. On such awkward terms, he couldn't remember feeling awkward with Penelope. Ever know, that wasn't true. There was that time, dear God. How many years ago was it? Six, seven. His mother had been pestering him about getting married, which was nothing new except this time she'd suggested Penelope as a potential bride, which was new, and Colin just hadn't been in the mood to deal with his mother's matchmaking in his usual manner, which was to tease her back dot, and then she just hadn't stopped. She'd talked about Penelope all day.
and night. It seemed, until Colin finally fled the country. Nothing drastic, just a short jaunt to Wales, but really, what had his mother been thinking? When he'd returned, his mother had wanted to speak with him, of course except this time it had been because his sister. Daphne was with child again, and she had wanted to make a family announcement, but how was he to have known that, so he had not been looking forward to the visit, since he was sure it would involve a great deal of completely unveiled hints about marriage. Then he had run into his brothers, and they'd started tormenting him about the very same subject, as only brothers can do, and the next thing he knew, he announced in a very loud voice that he was not going to marry Penelope Featherington, except somehow Penelope had been standing right there in the doorway, her hand to her mouth, her eyes wide with pain and embarrassment and probably a dozen other unpleasant emotions that he'd been too ashamed to delve into. It had been one of the most awful moments of his life, one, in fact, that he made an effort not to remember. He didn't think Penelope had ever fancied him, at least not any more than other ladies fancied him, but he'd embarrassed her. To single her out for such an announcement, dot it had been unforgivable. He'd apologised, of course, and she'd accepted, but he'd never quite forgiven himself. And now he'd gone and insulted her again. Not in as direct a manner, of course, but he should have thought a bit longer and harder before complaining about his life. Hell, it had sounded stupid, even to him. What did he have to complain about? Nothing. And yet, there was still this nagging emptiness, a longing, really, for something he couldn't define. He was jealous of his brothers, for God's sake, for having found their passions, their legacies, the only mark Colin had left on the world was in the pages of Lady Whistledown's society papers. What a joke, but all things were relative, weren't they, and compared to Penelope. He had little to complain about, which probably meant that he should have kept his thoughts to himself. He didn't like to think of her as an on-the-shelf spinster, but he supposed that was exactly what she was, and it wasn't a position of much reverence in British society dot in fact. It was a situation about which many people would complain, bitterly. Penelope had never once presented herself as anything less than a stoic, perhaps not content with her lot, but at least accepting of it. And who knows, maybe Penelope had hopes and dreams of a life beyond the one she shared with her mother and sister. In their small home on Mount Street, maybe she had plans and goals of her own, but kept them to herself. Under a veil of dignity and good humour, maybe there was more to her than there seemed, maybe. He thought with a sigh. She deserved an apology. He wasn't precisely certain what he needed to apologise for. He wasn't certain there was a precise thing that needed it. But the situation needed something dot or hell. Now he was going to have to attend the Smyre Smith musical this evening. It was a painful discordant annual event, just when one was sure that all the Smythe Smith daughters had grown up, some new cousin rose to take her place, each more tone deaf than the last, but that was where Penelope was going to be that evening, and that meant that was where Colin would have to be as well. Chapter 7 Colin Bridgerton had quite the bevy of young ladies at his side. At the Smythe Smith Musica Wednesday night, all fawning over his injured hand. This author does not know how the injury was sustained indeed. Mr. Bridgerton has been rather annoyingly tight-lipped about it. Speaking of annoyances, the man in question seemed rather irritated by all of the attention. Indeed, this author overheard him tell his brother Anthony that he wished he'd left the unrepeatable. Word bandage at home. Lady Whistledown's society papers, 16 April, 1-8-4. Why, why, why did she do this to herself? Year after year the invitation arrived by messenger. And year after year Penelope swore she would never. As God was her witness, 
ever attend another Smythe Smith musicale. And yet year after year, she found herself seated in the Smythe Smith music room, desperately trying not to cringe, at least not visibly, as the latest generation of Smythe Smith girls butchered poor Mr. Mozart's in musical effigy. It was painful, horribly, awfully, hideously painful, truly. There was no other way to describe it. Even more perplexing was that Penelope always seemed to end up in the front row, or close to it, which was beyond excruciating, and not just on the ears. Every few years, there would be one Smith girl who seemed aware that she was taking part in what could only be termed a crime against auditory law, while the other girls attacked their violins and pianofortes with oblivious vigour. This odd one outplayed, with a pained expression on her face, an expression Penelope knew well. It was the face one put on when one wanted to be anywhere but where one was. You could try to hide it, but it always came out in the corners of the mouth, which were held tight and taut, and the eyes, of course, which floated either above or below everyone else's line of vision. Heaven knew Penelope's face had been cursed with that same expression many a time. Maybe that was why. She never quite managed to stay home or a smiled Smith night. Someone had to smile encouragingly and pretend to enjoy the music dot besides. It wasn't as if she were forced to come and listen more than once per year. Anyway, still, one couldn't help but think that there must be a fortune to be made in discreet earplugs. The quartet of girls were warming up a jumble of discordant notes and scales that only promised to worsen. Once they began to play in earnest, Penelope had taken a seat in the centre of the second row, much to her sister Felicity's dismay. There are two perfectly good seats in the back corner. Felicity hissed in her ear. It's too late now, Penelope returned settling down on the lightly cushioned chair. God help me, Felicity groaned. Penelope picked up her program and began leafing through it. If we don't sit here, someone else will, she said. Precisely my desire. Penelope leaned in, so that only her sister could hear her murmured words. We can be counted on to smile and be polite. Imagine if someone like Cressida Twombly sat here and snickered all the way. Through. Felicity looked around. I don't think Cressida Twombly would be caught dead here. Penelope chose to ignore the statement. The last thing they need is someone seated right in front who likes to make unkind remarks. Those poor girls would be mortified. They're going to be mortified anyway. Felicity grumbled. No. They won't, Penelope said. At least not that one. That one. Or that one, she said pointing to the two on violins and the one at the piano. But that one, she motioned discreetly to the girl sitting with a cello between her knees, is already miserable. The least we can do is not to make it worse by allowing someone catty and cruel to sit here. She's only going to be eviscerated later this week. By Lady Whistledown, Felicity muttered. Penelope opened her mouth to say more. But at that exact moment, she realised that the person who had just occupied the seat on her other side was Eloise. Eloise, Penelope said with obvious delight. I thought you were planning to stay home, Eloise grimaced, her skin taking on a decidedly green pallor. I can't explain it, but I can't seem to stay away. It's rather like a carriage accident. You just can't not look. Or listen, Felicity said as the case may be. Penelope smiled. She couldn't help it. Did I hear you talking about Lady Whistledown when I arrived? Eloise asked. I told Penelope. Felicity said, leaning rather inelegantly across her sister to speak to Eloise, that they're going to be destroyed by Lady W later this week. I don't know, Eloise said thoughtfully. She doesn't pick on the Smythe Smith girls every year. I'm not sure why, I know why, cackled a voice from behind, Eloise, Penelope, and Felicity all twisted in their seats, then lurched backward.
As Lady Danbury's cane came perilously close to their faces, Lady Danbury, Penelope gulped. Unable to resist the urge to touch her nose if only to reassure herself that it was still there, I have that Lady Whistledown figured out, Lady Danbury said. You do? Felicity asked. She's soft at heart. The old lady continued. You see that one? Shep oaked her cane in the direction of the cellist. Nearly piercing Eloise's ear in the process. Right over there, yes, Eloise said, rubbing her ear. Although I don't think. I'm going to be able to hear her. Probably a blessing. Lady Danbury said before turning back to the subject at hand. You can thank me later. You were saying something about the cellist. Penelope said swiftly, before Eloise said something entirely inappropriate. Of course I was. Look at her, Lady Danbury said. She's miserable. And well she should be. She's clearly the only one who has a clue as to how dreadful they are. The other three don't have the musical sense of a gnat. Penelope gave her younger sister a rather smug glance. You mark my words, Lady Danbury said. Lady Whistledown won't have a thing to say about this musical. She won't want to hurt that one's feelings. The rest of them, Felicity, Penelope, and Eloise all ducked as the cane came swinging by. Bah, she couldn't care less for the rest of them. It's an interesting theory, Penelope said. Lady Danbury sat back contentedly in her chair. Yes, it is, isn't it? Penelope nodded. I think you're right. HMMPH. I usually am. Still twisted in her seat, Penelope turned first to Felicity, then to Eloise and said, It's the same reason. Why I keep coming to these infernal musicals year after year, to see Lady Danbury. Eloise asked, blinking with confusion. No, because of girls like her. Penelope pointed at the cellist, because I know exactly how she feels. Don't be silly, Penelope, Felicity said. You've never played piano in public, and even if you did, you're quite accomplished. Penelope turned to her sister. It's not about the music, Felicity. Then the oddest thing happened to Lady Danbury. Her face changed, completely. Utterly, astoundingly changed. Her eyes grew misty, wistful, and her lips which were usually slightly pinched and sarcastic at the corners, softened. I was that girl, too, Miss Featherington. She said, so quietly that both Eloise and Felicity were forced to lean forward. Eloise with an, I beg your pardon. And Felicity with a considerably less polite, what? But Lady Danbury only had eyes for Penelope. It's why I attend, year after year, the older lady said. Just like you and for a moment Penelope felt the oddest sense of connection to the older woman, which was mad, because they had nothing in common aside from gender not age, not status, nothing. And yet it was almost as if the Countess had somehow chosen her for what purpose. Penelope could never guess, but she seemed determined to light a fire. Under Penelope's well-ordered and often boring life, and Penelope couldn't help but think that it was somehow working. Isn't it nice to discover that we're not exactly what we thought we were? Lady Danbury's words from the other night still echoed in Penelope's head, almost like a litany, almost like a dare. Do you know what I think? Miss Featherington, Lady Danbury asked, her tone deceptively mild. I couldn't possibly begin to guess. Penelope said with great honesty, and respect in her voice. I think you could be lady. Whistle down. Felicity and Eloise gasped. Penelope's lips parted with surprise. No one had ever even thought to accuse her of such before. It was unbelievable, unthinkable, and rather flattering. Actually, Penelope felt her mouth sliding into a sly smile, and she leaned forward, as if getting ready to impart news of great import. Lady Danbury leaned forward. Felicity and Eloise leaned forward. Do you know what I think? Lady Danbury, Penelope asked, in a compellingly soft voice. Well, Lady D said, a wicked gleam in her eye. 
I would tell you that I am breathless with anticipation, but you've already told me once before that you think that I am Lady Whistledown. Are you? Lady Danbury smiled archly. Maybe I am. Felicity and Eloise gasped again, louder this time. Penelope's stomach lurched. Are you admitting it? Eloise whispered. Of course I'm not admitting it, Lady Danbury barked, straightening. Her spine and thumping her cane against the floor with enough force to momentarily stop. The four amateur musicians in their warm-up, even if it were true and. I'm not saying whether or not it is. Would I be fool enough to admit it? Then why did you say, because, you ninny head? I'm trying to make a point. She then proceeded to fall silent until Penelope was forced to ask, which is. Lady Danbury gave them all an extremely exasperated look. That. Anyone could be Lady Whistledown, she exclaimed, thumping her cane on the floor with renewed vigour. Anyone at all, well, except me, Felicity put in. I'm quite certain it's not me. Lady Danbury didn't even honour Felicity with a glance. Let me tell you something, she said. As if we could stop you, Penelope said. So sweetly that it came out like a compliment. And truth be told, it was a compliment. She admired Lady Danbury a great deal. She admired anyone. Who knew how to speak her mind in public. Lady Danbury chuckled. There's more to you than meets the eye, Penelope Featherington. It's true. Felicity said with a grin. She can be rather cruel. For example, nobody would believe it, but when we were young... Penelope elbowed her in the ribs, see, Felicity said. What I was going to say, Lady Danbury continued, was that the ton is going about my challenge all wrong. How do you suggest we go about it? Then, Eloise asked. Lady Danbury waved her hand dismissively. In Eloise's face... I have to explain what people are doing wrong first, she said. They keep looking toward the obvious people. People like your mother, she said. Turning to Penelope and Felicity, mother. They both echoed. Oh, please, Lady Danbury scoffed. A bigger busybody this town has never seen. She's exactly the sort of person everyone suspects. Penelope had no idea what to say to that. Her mother was a notorious gossip, but it was difficult to imagine her as Lady Whistledown, which is why Lady Danbury continued, a shrewd look in her eye. It can't be her. Well, that, Penelope said with a touch of sarcasm, and the fact that Felicity and I could tell you for certain that it's not her. Pish. If your mother were Lady Whistledown, she'd have figured out a way to keep it from you. My mother... Felicity said doubtfully, I don't think so. What I am trying to say, Lady Danbury ground out. Prior to all of these infernal interruptions, Penelope thought she heard Eloise snort, was that if Lady Whistledown was someone obvious, she'd have been found out by now, don't you think? Silence, until it became clear some response was required. Then all three of them nodded with appropriate thoughtfulness and vigour. She must be someone that nobody suspects, Lady Danbury said. She has to be. Penelope found herself nodding again. Lady Danbury did make sense. In a strange sort of way. Which is why. The older lady continued triumphantly. I am not a likely candidate, Penelope blinked. Not quite following the logic. I beg your pardon. Oh, please. Lady Danbury gave Penelope quite the most disdainful glance. Do you think you're the first person to suspect me? Penelope just shook her head. I still think it's you. That earned her a measure of respect. Lady Danbury nodded approvingly as she said. You're cheekier than you look. Felicity leaned forward and said in a rather conspiratorial voice. It's true. Penelope swatted her sister's hand. Felicity... I think the musical is starting, Eloise said. Heaven help us all, Lady Danbury announced. I don't know why I, Mr. Bridgerton, Penelope had turned to face the small stage area. But she whipped back, around to see Colin making his way along the row to the empty seat beside Lady Danbury.
apologizing good-naturedly as he bumped into people's knees. His apologies, of course, were accompanied by one of his lethal smiles, and no fewer than three ladies positively melted in their seats as a result. Penelope frowned. It was disgusting, Penelope. Felicity whispered, Did you just growl, Colin, Eloise said. I didn't know you were coming, he shrugged, his face alight with a lopsided grin. Changed my mind a last moment. I've always been a great lover of music, after all, which would explain your presence here. Eloise said in an exceptionally dry voice. Colin acknowledged her statement with nothing more than an arch of his brow. Before turning to Penelope and saying, Good evening, Miss Featherington, he nodded at Felicity with another, Miss Featherington. It took Penelope a moment to find her voice. They had parted most awkwardly that afternoon, and now here he was with a friendly smile. Good evening, Mr. Bridgerton, she finally managed. Does anyone know what is on the programme tonight? he asked, looking terribly interested. Penelope had to admire that. Colin had a way of looking at you, if nothing in the world could be more interesting than your. Next sentence. It was a talent that, especially now, when they all knew that he couldn't possibly care one way or another. What the Smyre Smith girls chose to play that evening, I believe it's Mozart. Felicity said, they almost always choose Mozart. Lovely, Colin replied, leaning back in his chair if he'd just finished an excellent meal. I'm a great fan of Mr. Mozart. In that case, Lady Danbury cackled, elbowing him in the ribs. You might want to make your escape while the possibility still exists. Don't be silly, he said. I'm sure the girls will do their best, oh. There's no question of them doing their best, Eloise said ominously, S-H-H-H, Penelope said. I think they're ready to begin, not. She admitted to herself that she was especially eager to listen to the Smythesmith version. Avin Klein Natch Music, but she felt profoundly ill at ease with Colin. She wasn't sure what to say to him except that whatever it was, she should say definitely shouldn't be said in front of Eloise. Felicity, and most of all Lady Danbury, a butler came around and snuffed out a few. Candles to signal that the girls were ready to begin. Penelope braced herself, swallowed in such a way as to clog her inner ear canals. It didn't work. And then the torture began dot and went on. And on. And on dot Penelope wasn't certain what was more agonising the music or... The knowledge that Colin was sitting right behind her. The back of her neck prickled with awareness, and she found herself fidgeting like mad, her fingers tapping relentlessly on the dark blue velvet of her skirts when the Smythesmith Quartet was finally done. Three of the girls were beaming at the polite applause, and the fourth the cellist looked as if she wanted to crawl under a rock, Penelope sighed. At least she in all of her unsuccessful seasons, hadn't ever been forced to parade her deficiencies before all the ton like these girls had. She'd always been allowed to melt into the shadows, to hover quietly at the perimeter of the room, watching the other girls take their turns on the dance floor. Oh, her mother dragged her here and there, trying to place her in the path of some eligible gentleman or another. But that was nothing, nothing like what the Smyre Smith girls were forced to endure, although, in all honesty, three out of the four seemed blissfully unaware of their musical ineptitude. Penelope just smiled and clapped. She certainly wasn't going to burst their collective bubble. And if Lady Danbury's theory was correct, Lady Whistledown wasn't going to write a word about the musical. The applause petered out rather quickly, and soon everyone was milling about making polite conversation with their neighbours and eyeing the sparsely laid refreshment table. At the back of the room, Lemonade, Penelope murmured to herself. Perfect. She was dreadfully hot, really. What had she been thinking? Wearing velvet on such a warm night. And a cool beverage would be just the thing to make her feel better. Not to mention that. Colin was trapped in conversation with Lady Danbury.
so it was the ideal time to make her escape. But as soon as Penelope had her glass in hand, she heard Colin's achingly familiar voice behind her, murmuring her name, she turned around. And before she had any idea what she was doing, she said, I'm sorry, you are, yes. She assured him, at least I think I am. His eyes crinkled slightly at the corners. The conversation grows more intriguing by the second, Colin. He held out his arm. Take a turn with me around the room, will you? I don't think. He moved his arm closer to her just by an inch or so, but the message was clear. Please, he said. She nodded and set her lemonade. Down. Very well. They walked in silence for almost a minute. Then Colin said, I would like to apologise to you. I was the one who stormed out of the room, Penelope pointed out. He tilted his head slightly, and she could see an indulgent smile playing across his lips. I'd hardly call it storming, he said. Dot Penelope frowned. She probably shouldn't have left. In such a huff, but know that she had. She was oddly proud of it. It wasn't every day that a woman such as herself got to make such a dramatic exit. Well, I shouldn't have been so rude, she muttered. By now not really meaning it, he arched a brow. Then obviously decided not to pursue the matter. I would like to apologise, he said, for being such a whiny little brat. Penelope actually tripped over her feet. He helped her regain her balance, then said, I am aware that I have many, many things in my life, for which I should be grateful, for which I am grateful. He corrected, his mouth not quite smiling, but certainly sheepish. It was unforgivably rude to complain to you. No, she said. I have spent all evening thinking about what you said. And while I, she swallowed, then licked her lips, which had gone quite dry. She'd spent all day trying to think of the right words, and she'd thought that she'd found them. But now that he was here, at her side, she couldn't think of a deuce thing. Do you need another glass of lemonade? Colin asked. Politely. She shook her head. You have every right to your feelings. She blurted out. They may not be what I would feel, were I in your shoes. But you have every right to them. But she broke off. And Colin found himself rather desperate to know what she'd planned to say. But what, Penelope, he urged, it's nothing. It's not nothing to me. His hand was on her arm, and so he squeezed slightly, to let her know that he meant what he said, for the longest time. He didn't think she was actually going to respond. And then, just when he thought his face would crack from the smile he held so carefully on his lips, they were in public, after all, and it wouldn't do to invite comment and speculation by appearing urgent and disturbed she sighed. It was a lovely sound, strangely comforting, soft and wise, and it made him want to look at her more closely, to see into her mind, to hear the rhythms of her soul, Colin, Penelope said quietly, if you feel frustrated by your current situation, you should do something to change it, it's really that simple, that's what I do, he said with a careless shrug of his outside shoulder. My mother accuses me of picking up and leaving the country completely on whim, but the truth is, you do it when you're feeling frustrated. She finished for him. He nodded. She understood him. He wasn't sure how it had happened, or even that it made any sense. But Penelope Featherington understood him. I think you should publish your journals, she said. I couldn't, why not? He stopped in his tracks, letting go of her arm. He didn't really have an answer, other than the odd pounding in his heart. Who would want to read them? He finally asked. I would, she said frankly. Ello it's Felicity, she added. Ticking off names on her fingers. Your mother, Lady Whistledown. I'm sure, she added with a mischievous smile. She does write about you rather a lot. Her good humour was infectious, and Colin couldn't quite suppress his smile. Penelope. It doesn't count if the only people who buy the book are the people I know. Why not? Her lips twitched. You know a lot of people. Why? If you only count Bridgertons, 
He grabbed her hand. He didn't know why, but he grabbed her hand. Penelope, stop. She just laughed. I think Eloise told me that you have piles and piles of cousins as well. And enough, he warned. But he was grinning as he said it. Penelope stared down at her hand in his. Then said, Lots of people will want to read about your travels. Maybe at first it will only be. Because you're a well-known figure in London. But it won't take long before everyone realises what a good writer you are. And then they'll be clamouring for more. I don't want to be a success because of the Bridgerton name, he said. She dropped his hand and planted hers on her hips. Are you even listening to me? I just told you that. What are you to talking about, Eloise? Looking very, very curious, nothing. They both muttered at the same time. Eloise snorted. Don't insult me. It's not nothing. Penelope looked as if. She might start breathing fire at any moment. Your brother is just being obtuse, Penelope said. Well, that is nothing new, Eloise said. Wait a moment, Colin exclaimed. But what, Eloise probed, ignoring him entirely, is he being obtuse about? It's a private matter, Colin ground out. Which makes it all the more interesting, Eloise said. She looked at Penelope expectantly. I'm sorry, Penelope said. I really can't say. I can't believe it, Eloise cried out. You're not going to tell me. No, Penelope replied. Feeling rather oddly satisfied with herself, I'm not. I can't believe it, Eloise said again, turning to her brother. I can't believe it. His lips quirked into the barrest of smiles. Believe it. You're keeping secrets from me. He raised his brows. Did you think I told you everything? Of course not, she scowled, but I thought Penelope did. But this isn't my secret to tell, Penelope said. It's Colin's. I think the planet has shifted on its axis, Eloise grumbled. Or perhaps England has crashed into France. All I know is this is not the same world. I inhabited just this morning. Penelope couldn't help it. She giggled. And you're laughing at me, Eloise added. No, I'm not, Penelope said. Laughing. Really, I'm not. Do you know what you need? Colin asked. Me, Eloise queried. He nodded. A husband. You're as bad as mother. I could be a lot worse if I really put my mind to it. Of that I have no doubt. Eloise shot back. Stop, stop, Penelope said. Truly laughing in earnest now. They both looked at her expectantly, as if to say, Now what? I'm so glad I came tonight, Penelope said. The words tumbling. Unbidden from her lips. I can't remember a nicer evening. Truly, I can't. Several hours later, as Colin was lying in bed, staring up at the ceiling in the bedroom of his new flat in Bloomsbury, it occurred to him that he felt the exact same way.